The Candid Frame is supported by donations by listeners just like you. Help us to bring you great conversations with great photographers. Support the show today with your monthly contribution through our Patreon effort at patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame or click on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. Thank you. This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. Several months ago, I and several other photographers participated in LA Street Week, a week-long celebration of street photography that was held at the Los Angeles Center of Photography. And part of that event was two days of presentations from street photographers, each discussing their unique approach to working on the street. It was an amazing weekend, and I was very happy to be given permission to record these presentations so that I could share them with you. Now, these are just short segments from each speaker, but a good thing is that each of these photographers has previously appeared on TCF. So, if this episode piques your interest, you can listen to an entire conversation with David Ingraham, Michelle Groskopf, Kevin Weinstein, John Free, and Rinzi Ruiz. I'll have links to each of their episodes in the show notes, but the best way to these episodes is by downloading the Candid Frame app, where you can do a search on the person's name and begin listening immediately. Now, each speaker will sometimes be referencing a photograph that you will be unable to see, but don't let that deter you from really appreciating the insight that each of these segments provides. And of course, you can check out the photographer's work at their respective websites. We begin with David Ingraham, a street photographer who works exclusively with his iPhone. In this segment, David talks about the importance of working with a limitation. No, actually, I want to thank everybody for showing up today and uh, spending your Saturday afternoon with us. My style isn't necessarily what you would consider traditional street photography, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean in a minute. Before I do that, I want to just sort of give you some insight into my background as far as what brought me to the point I'm at as a photographer now. That point being all street photography, all iPhone. Uh, As far as the genre of street photography is concerned, it's something I've been passionately pursuing for about six years now. It's, It's been my main form of creative expression during that time. But that wasn't always the case because uh, during my early formative years as a photographer, I was all over the map. I was so inspired by so many different photographers, so many different types of photography, that I couldn't find my thing. I I wanted to do it all. I was like a kid in a candy store. So I was shooting film and digital. I was shooting color and black and white. I was shooting, you know, dabbling in portraiture and landscape photography. I was doing street photography, but I was also doing you know, long exposure night photography. I was all, all over the place. I couldn't really find my voice. And I knew this was a problem because all the great photographers, all the big names, they all made a name for themselves by finding that thing and building a strong body of work doing a particular type of photography. So I knew that was a necessary goal to reach and I hadn't gotten there yet. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter who I name. If I were to name uh, Alex Webb, we think of bold, colorful, complex street photography. If I were to name uh, James Noctway, I think of, you know, war, conflict, photojournalism. If I were to name uh, Richard Avedon, Irving Penn, we think of black and white portraiture. When I thought of David Ingram, nothing. I didn't, I didn't have that thing yet, and I knew that was something I had to eventually achieve. Uh, Something would occur, a certain shift in circumstances and technology that would finally help me to find my footing as a photographer and get me on that pathway towards my own style and approach. And that was getting one of these. Um, I got my first iPhone in around 2010, I believe. And uh, it it was a game changer. It, It 
opened up doors uh, creatively for me that hadn't been opened before. It was, it was a life changer for me in the sense that it opened up doors of opportunity that I hadn't foreseen. As far as getting my <clears throat> work noticed, uh, getting it in publications, shows, teaching workshops, doing presentations. I, I literally wouldn't be standing here <clears throat> in front of you right now if it weren't for the iPhone. So basically, here, here's what happened. I'm going to uh, go back into my <clears throat> background a little bit. As Julia mentioned, I st- I've been shooting ever since I was a kid. Right around middle school, I got my first camera. I eventually graduated to an SLR in my teens. But uh, during this time, I was just, as is the case with a lot of kids, I was just shooting for the fun of it. I was documenting you know, family trips, holidays, last days at school, what have you. It wasn't until the turn of the new millennium, which means around my mid-30s, so I'm a bit of a late bloomer. I'm 52 now. I started getting serious around 35 or so. That was when I started to really study the work of the greats. That's when I I enrolled in a darkroom class at UCLA, eventually building a darkroom in my home. This was during the time when the digital revolution was already in full swing. So I, I, you know, as I was building a darkroom, most other photographers were dismantling and getting rid of theirs. But I was, I was just intent on learning the art form because so many of the great photographers who inspired me, W. Eugene Smith being just one of them, they came from a film darkroom background. And I had always been, you know, just uh, fascinated with the alchemy and mystery of the darkroom experience. So I, I was intent on learning that. Although the ease and convenience of digital eventually seduced me away from film once and for all, I have no regrets about that particular period because everything I learned in the darkroom, I'm now able to apply using various apps with the iPhone. Um, I do all my shooting, all my processing with the iPhone via apps like Snapseed, which is my main go-to processing app. I can do all the dodging, the burning, the upping the contrast, the pulling out shadow detail, basically everything I learned in the darkroom. I'm now applying using my phone. Fast forward a few years, uh, as Julia mentioned, I'm a touring musician. I was looking for a more travel-friendly camera. I was getting tired of lugging gear around the country and world. And it, at this time, <clears throat> I saw some of the work that was being done with the first iPhone. And it really stopped me in my tracks because I, I realized the work I was seeing, it wasn't just representational photography, it was interpretational. I was seeing creative, artistic work being done with the thing. That's when I realized... This is a creative tool. I thought, if I could get one of those, a pocket-sized camera that I could shoot, process, and post all from the palm of my hand, I thought, that's it. That's all I would need. I'd I'd have the perfect travel camera. Everything else could go in my closet, and it's been there for the last six years. Loads of lenses and bodies, and it's kind of sad, but I, I haven't been able to put this thing down since. During that time, after getting this, I had basically three realizations that fired me up and set me on my path photographically that I'm still on now. The first one being the fact that this, in my opinion, is the ultimate street camera. If the Leica in the 30s and 40s made street photography possible, I believe this takes it to the next level. Due to its size, its ubiquity, its inconspicuousness, it allows me to just disappear into the streets and capture images in a way that I hadn't been able to before. <clears throat> I have certain techniques or approaches where I can be fiddling about, pretend talking on the phone, fiddle about more, take your photo, walk off, you know, whatever it takes. Whether that's sneaky or not, it's, it's what I have to do. So basically it's provided me a level of invisibility in the streets that I just wasn't able to achieve with a larger camera because as many of you know, the second you lift that Fuji or SLR, everybody looks. I just I got tired of that. The second realization was that mobile photography was the latest chapter in the history of photography. And I was in the perfect place at the right time because I realized this chapter in photographic history was unfolding before my eyes right then and there. I had just gotten the camera. I was seeing amazing work being done. And I felt like this door of opportunity was wide open, and I I thought, all I got to do is step through that door, start doing the best work I could, and who knows where it'll lead. But I just felt like 
the, just that realization got me so fired up. I thought, I want to be part of this. I want to play a role in this, this new movement, this new piece of history. Um, last but not least, Instagram. I think I got my first iPhone in the summer of 2010. Instagram came along, I believe, in the fall, and I was on it very shortly after. In the early days of Instagram, it wasn't so saturated. It was much easier to get a sort of visual dialogue going with fellow photographers. It was much easier to get your work seen. There was more of a community feel. It's still, don't get me wrong, Instagram's still a great place to get your work seen. I recommend it for any photographer who's serious. But it's, it's, there's so many millions of photographers on there now, such a glut of imagery that it's kind of hard. It's easier to get lost in the shuffle. In the earlier stages, it wasn't quite like that. So not only was I seeing great work, inspiring work by photographers like uh, Richard Cochi Hernandez, just to name one, but I, I recognized that a lot of these photographers that I was connecting with were coming from a similar background as myself, the film darkroom analog background I could see it in their work but what it really came down to is for the first time in my life I had what I viewed as a a worldwide exhibition space in the palm of my hand Uh, I I can post an image and within seconds someone in Iran someone in Istanbul someone in uh, Australia is commenting on my work in other words I had an audience for the first time coming from a film background I'd make prints I liked shove them in a portfolio or a photo album, shove them in a cupboard somewhere. The idea of now having like an instant audience worldwide just changed everything for me because knowing that I was being watched, so to speak, put a fire under my ass because I, you know, I was being watched by photographers whose work I admired, so I didn't want to suck. <laughs> so I wanted to just get out there and do the best work I could. So it was, it was those three realizations that just fired me up like I'd never been fired up before. And for the first time in my life, I was able to shove aside all the other distractions and genres and say, that's it. All street photography, all iPhone, all black and white for the most part. And it was when I put those restrictions upon myself and worked within those restrictions that I started to find my own style. I started to not only produce the best work I had produced up to that point, but I became more prolific than I'd ever been at that point. So when everything sort of fell into place, it was almost, it felt almost like I'd become a photographer overnight. This clearly wasn't the case. It was years in the making, but when everything finally happened for me, it's like the floodgates just opened up creatively, opportunity-wise. It's still happening, so I'm on that same path. Next, John Free. John Free has been a presence in the world of photography in LA for decades, long before street photography enjoyed its explosion of popularity. His passion for photography is always evident, especially as he explains why it's important for a photographer to take risks and be a hero with a camera. I want to maybe talk about maybe something a little different about the fact that there is no creativity unless you push the button exactly when your brain tells you to. If you're half a second off, there's no creativity. And if you're thinking about creativity, you're probably not doing your job. But if you do your job, the creativity will take care of itself. If you're on time. But most of us aren't on time because we're not used to the device. I'm a black and white photographer. I was shocked in 1969 on Christmas Eve when we bought a camera in Frankfurt, Germany. My wife and I were backpacking all over the place. And when I touched that camera, it was like Mr. Toad on his wild ride. Steam came out of my ears. You know? And some of my first photographs on my first roll of film, I'm still happy with and selling sometimes. It's changed my life. It's given me a, a tremendous uh, job to do in photography. And that's what it is. It's not, it's not a pastime for me. It's not fun for me. It's not uh, a holiday for me. It's intentionally difficult, wonderful work. And I do it for you. I don't take pictures for myself. I take pictures for you. I try to have at least three things in the photograph that relate to each other all the time, constantly, or I won't take the photograph. I'm trying hard not to take photographs unless they add up. 
I don't take it just because it might come out, because that's like slapping my face. Anyway, what I was telling you about before, about let's get rid of the creativity and get back to the mechanical aspect of this, because that's basically really what it is. We're dealing with a machine. The camera is a machine. And one of the problems that I've noticed after teaching for 25 years, and as a teacher or a coach, I'd rather be a coach, I watch people in my workshops, and I watch people out of my workshops that are photographing, and I try to see where their problems are. We all have the same problems, you know. And uh, I think we have to really work on the mechanical aspect of the camera. You know, a lot of my workshops and, and lectures and classes that I've had over the years, I tell people to practice, and very few of them ever t- come back and tell me that they practice. I practice all the time, mechanically, with the fingers. You know, I'm getting older and slower, so I have to continually practice. Because to miss a shot is like someone smacking me right in the face with a fist, you know? Because I was a pro for, you know, many, many, many years. And there's a big difference when you're a pro and when you're an amateur. The amateur misses a shot. Oh, you don't even notice it. He doesn't even change his expression. No big deal. But when you're a professional and they're paying you big money a day and they're sending you out on a documentary project, they don't want to hear about your missus. And, I, you know, and that's what's wonderful about documentary photography. The pressure you got to have pressure. Most street photographers are walking around. It's like a game, you know, and there's no pressure on. But if you're getting paid five, ten grand a day to go and take photographs, you're just sweating. You're just terrible sweating. Or even a wedding photographer. I've done several weddings, and there's probably people here that do weddings. You want to sweat? You go to a wedding. Oh, my God. Oh. So I don't do weddings anymore. <laughs> but please, please do this. Be a hero with the camera. Don't just walk around taking pictures of hubcaps and things like that. Go next door to that old lady who's crazy, and there's terrible stuff in her yard. It looks like a junkyard. No one speaks to her, and she's an old grouch. But you look over the fence one day, and you see that her grandson, Tommy, is visiting from Ohio. Tommy's visiting for the day, and you can see that he's the love of her life. And now that you've got a little chutzpah, a little guts in you, and you have a little respect for the medium, you jump over the fence. You say, hi, Mrs. Jones, I'm taking a photography class. And you get down and you start taking pictures of her and Tommy. But you get them good and you get up close. And then you go away and jump back over the fence. And you go to the drugstore and you get twin pics. Okay? And you bring them back the next day. Tommy's gone now. He went back to Ohio, and she's alone again. And you jump over the fence, and you give her that pile of prints. And you watch her eyes when she's looking at those prints. And you know that she's going to take them in her house and put them on the mantelpiece, and she's going to have Tommy for every day of her short life because you took five minutes to jump over her fence and make some photographs. And if you don't do that, what the hell are you? You should be constantly photographing your neighbor's children and giving them (laughs) objects that they've never seen before in their children. And if you don't do that, you're a punk. You're not living up to what photography does best. Man to man, an explanation, and each man to himself. That's what you got to go. you got to go for the heart. And you don't take any easy shots. That's my new uh, theme in my workshops now. I I thought of that a few years ago. You want to be a good photographer? Don't take those ridiculous easy shots. I mean, come on. Robert said we must be detectives. Find out what's going on. Find out how to get there and go there. My son is my partner in these workshops. and He said, Dad, talk about yourself. Don't just ramble around. You know, talk about what happened to you. Well, I started, I told you, in Germany when I got the camera. But before that, when I was a kid, I was a squirrel hunter in Connecticut. I don't want to bring killing up, but, I mean, there is a, there is a very distinct similarity between squirrel hunting and street photography, you know. you got to understand the nature of the animal and his habits and where you can find them. You look for the beech trees, that's where they are. And what the tr- squirrel is going to do, and with a single shot twenty two, how are you going to get that squirrel when he's jumping all over the place? Then I went in the military, and I became a marksmanship instructor in the Marine Corps, teaching snipers so they could go to Vietnam and get shot at, you know. And I was on the Marine Corps rifle team. And before that, I was building hot rod engines, and now I customize automobiles and rebuild boats and rebuild antique cars and I'm, I'm just saying that because it's all just technical 
uh, you're measuring stuff, not like taking a picture in the street, but I want you to think of it, it is taking a picture in the street. I don't want you to go out and think, well, we'll just be creative and just let it happen. You're thinking too much about creativity and not enough about the mechanical aspects of the situation and the pressure on you to bring home the shot. Forget about your creativity. You can't control it. No one can control their creativity. It's hard enough to control your memory. But what I found and what I think, and don't hold me to this, everybody is just as creative as everybody else in some way, but they can't get it out because they're trying to be creative. It's down here. It's down here. But when you're working and you're looking, we got him, we got this, and we got the timing, we got this light here, and we got all these things to think of. You know, a lot of people, Brisson said, you never think when you're taking a picture. Well, you got to focus. And I know what he means. The camera goes off automatically when you got everything right. You can't help it. That's the subconscious coming in. That's where maybe where the creativity comes in. But you can't control it. But you can help it along by not being late. Learn how to focus that camera. Autofocus doesn't work. It will never work. Everything is about speed. If you're late, you're late. So you've got to be fast. It's amazing. This is the hardest form of photography I've ever been involved with. It's harder than sports photography because you know the nature of the game. But what I'm really here today is to get you excited because all the years that I've done these workshops... (laughs) I found that anybody can do this, but you're afraid to do this. Yeah, you got to be born with it. You know, you just can't do that shit. You got, you know, you got to be born with it. That's crazy. You know, you got to be a born mechanic. No, it can be learned, and I've watched it. One guy came to my workshop, just this one guy, and we just talked to him a couple of minutes. My son and I. Boom! This was in London. The next day, he came in with 36 or 40 photographs. Each one was dynamite. Each one. I forget his name. He lives in Switzerland. And I use this example all the time. But the people who were in that work, we were all blown away. And we were so happy. People were crying about it because this guy was just so thrilled that we showed him and we told him how great his photographs were. But he deserved it. He listened. And that night, he stayed up late and he went to an all-night place where he could develop his film and he made all those prints and he stayed up all night and brought it to us exhausted in the morning. And he's a winner and he'll never forget that. And I want you to have that feeling. I want you to do that. Michelle Groskopf is easily one of my favorite ally photographers because like John Free, she is passionate about her work. But it's more than just passion. It's about loving your subjects, even when they're perfect strangers. Here she talks about the importance of trusting your gut and not being a slave to the rules. Basically, I treat the street like my studio, like I would a studio, and I wander around and I heed my gut and I follow my kind of, uh, I guess, inner eye. Anything that draws my attention or anything that I'm curious about or I'm interested in looking, that's the thing that I follow. I do shoot for myself. I give very little context. I'm not interested in context. I'm interested in controlling the frame and filling it with exactly what I'm looking at and what way I'm looking at it. And in that sense, I'm exploring myself. So I think photography is a great gift if you want to get to know yourself. I don't know. I'm not creeping around per se. I have a very big flash set up. So uh, definitely people see me coming. So that's another thing. There's a, a whole history of street photography and a lot of rules that people have taken on board. And I'm sure all of you have heard all of these rules and stress about them every day when you get out there with your camera. But I'm here to tell you that throw those rules out. I think that uh, those rules are a hindrance to my creativity. And so if I want to talk to somebody, I'll talk to somebody. If I want to get up close to a stranger and talk after the fact, I will. If I want to ask somebody to pose, I will. I'll do whatever I want with what I see in the street. And I don't feel poorly about that. Or, and I, I don't think that I'm not a part of the street photography community because of that. Although there are many who say that I am not. 
color is very important to me. And the details that I fill my, my frames with are very specific. And I play a lot with the idea of memory. And I think memory drives all of us. Certainly me. I grew up in a very suburban neighborhood with a very suburban experience. And that particular aesthetic filled me and still fills me and I'm still working through it. And so when I go and shoot, I find, especially looking back, um, a lot of the details are very reminiscent of my childhood. So like long nails, lots of jewelry. It's very much my inner world. I'm super drawn to color. I love the idea of fashion in the street. I love how people dress. I think basically the, the devil is in the details in the sense that you can fill a frame with anything, but for me, what makes people who they are or scenarios what they are or objects what they are are, you know, the details. And that's what I'm interested in. I got very close to people. I use a 50 millimeter lens. I occasionally use a 35, but usually lately it's been a 50 because I love how fat and it, the way it fills up the frame. And I get very close to people with my flash. So I often have a lot of um, interactions with people on the street. It's kind of hard to be a, a ninja when you're flashing people. But I think that that's a gift. I think I get to have amazing conversations with people. Sometimes I get yelled at, but for the most part, I have um, really, really warm and expressive conversations with people about what I do and you know their life and who they are. And usually I'll take the photo and then the conversation happens after the fact. But sometimes you know I'll do whatever it takes to get the shot, like I said. So... I'll happily, you know, chat somebody up and say, this is my intention, can I get this? I sp- this guy was amazing, I spoke to him after the fact. I shoot the beach a lot. There are very particular parts of L.A. L.A. is a muse for me, and there are very particular parts of L.A. that I spend my time shooting in, one of which is the beach. I think there are amazing things happening at the beach, and it's kind of a culmination of all kinds of people, different economic backgrounds, different skin colors. It's a very charged place because people are very... Uh, aware of their bodies and feel both free and maybe a little bit hindered. Um, so it's an exciting place to shoot. A little bit dangerous, I think. I like to get close and fill the frame with wonderful details. I love their skin color. I love the white from the chalk. They were brothers. He never woke up. I got like 20 photos of this guy. So. Wow. Yeah. People are really beautiful. Faces are really beautiful. I like the idea of no context because I like... Just the timelessness of no context and also that it could be anywhere. This could be anywhere. It could be maybe not anywhere, but any sunny Mediterranean locale. I like what that does to the imagination, details. I think this shot's been done a lot, but man, like when I saw that, (laughs) it's so good. Some people say I have a bit of an eagle eye. I like to see things very far away and that I just go and get it and... I get emotional too. I think not to bring up John a lot, but his crying. Like a cel- photography is such a beautiful celebration of who we are as people, all clumped together. And you know, people do the weirdest things, like this guy with his elastic bands on his hand. I mean, I don't know. We're all so weird. I, I'm very interested in the body, and if I ever see a cast or a band aid or a well placed band aid. I will definitely run and grab it because I think it's really beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, I'm gay, so I love gay culture. And I think photography can be really punk rock and be a great way to just assert ideas that are often forgotten or people don't want to look at something, so I'm going to show it to you. So queer culture is a big thing that if I see it, I'll jump on it. This is a typical, typical for me example of something from my past. This woman looks like any of my neighbors that I grew up with. Sometimes I'll exclude people's faces to, to, to kind of play with the idea of the universality of her outfit. I was at the racetrack. That's a great place to shoot. I love hair and weirdness. I don't know. I think my stuff's a little weird, but look at her hair. It's like a mane. That was at the racetrack. She's like a horse. I often wonder how I would do as a casting agent primarily because um, I love people so much and faces and there's so many good ones out there and once you start to see them it becomes very seductive this is on Venice Beach I often if I'm on Venice there's a lot of like you know kind of like 
travelers hanging out along the boardwalk, if you will, in tents and stuff. And they're always the nicest people. So that, that I always feel like I have to ask. But I went up and I do a lot of like really tight portraits of those guys and girls. And I love his face so much. Babies, fat legs. I mean, it's all so seductive. It's like candy for me. And I think that there's just something like we all, you know, we get up in the morning and we're looking and we go to sleep thinking about what we saw that day. And I think it's so valuable in our lives to kind of contemplate how we see the world and what we look at and to take the time to really embrace that and to love how we see the world and not always be chasing how other people see the world. This is my one piece of advice is, like I said, don't look sideways, don't look backwards. There's so many photographers and it's such a bore to be weighed down by history and to be thrown all these rules and... You just end up being in a corner, scared. And if you just kind of embrace who you are as a person, then photography really opens up to be something of a great gift. I'm doing a project on my neighbors. This, they're amazing. And it, this is the only photograph, photograph rather I have of this particular woman. It's their three Armenian brothers and sisters. It's two sisters and one brother, and they're quite elderly, and they're quite poor, and they live on their little corner plot house in Hollywood. And Sona here will never let me take her photo. But I secretly got her feet because her toes, I don't know if you could see, are really intense. But they're so sweet, but they're just like real characters. So I tend to shoot my neighbors a lot if I can. I shoot the farmer's market a lot. And I just love the surreal image. It's one I took last weekend. I shoot uh, almost every day. I shoot a lot, a lot, a lot. And I'm always working same like what John said about, you know, if I don't have my camera, then I'm always thinking about photographs and how, to f- how I would frame something. And I hate using my phone, but I will. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Washington to cover the inauguration and the Women's March. So it's a couple of uh, portraits. I love taking environmental portraits of people. If you just open your eyes, like it always drives me insane when I wander around and I see people just staring at the sidewalk or on their phones. Like, you're missing out on everything. It's just, you know, don't be shy. Just, like, get up in people's... You know, you just got to be brave. I don't know. Kevin Weinstein also enjoys having a connection to his subjects, sometimes in very intimate ways. Street photography led him to segue his interest in photography into more documentary work, photographing transvestites and street kids in San Francisco. But like all his work, it's about connection. It's about people and not just the beauty of a photograph. So a couple months after I um, started photography, I took a trip to Yosemite with my class, and I took this photo. It's one of the very first photos, and I actually still own this print. It's a fiber print, Kodak fiber paper. But this image to me means so much, because when I rediscovered it last year, I see so much of the way that I photograph now, 30 years later. For me, this was about the light, the angles, the way the shadows, you know, it's a very simple photo, but... In terms of how I photograph and how I see, I didn't realize until last summer that I had been seeking the same thing I seek today. You know, the the wonderful thing about getting into photography at such a young age without the internet and without without all these groups and everything that we have today, it's so noisy out there. Um, You don't know if you should buy a Fuji or a Leica. It's just ridiculous what's happening. But everything was organic. I didn't know what I was doing. If I, to overcome the whole, what does F2 mean and F16, I would obsessively shoot and try to figure out why F2 was different from F16. I I wasn't uh, bogged down with conventions. I literally just went out there and did what I needed to do. Got through high school for the uh, last couple years. During that time, I would hit the streets of San Francisco. I didn't know what else to do. But I loved photographing the people on the streets. That was my connection. Again, I don't necessarily at that time like people. I don't feel comfortable with people. So street photography gave me that connection to the outside world, which could have been easily this gentleman standing right here or you over there. It didn't matter. I just wanted to connect with you. So I did run around San Francisco. You're not going to see any of those photos. But what ended up happening, 
I discovered a uh, pamphlet, and it uh, had a, a very odd picture of somebody on the front, and I thought, I'm going in there. And I started to realize that street photography was okay, but everybody was passing by me. I wanted to know a little bit about what was behind that curtain. And then when I got behind that curtain, it really very quickly became, where do you live? What does your house look like? I would run around this nightclub, the end up in San Francisco, on Fridays and Sundays. Uh, Not Saturday, because Saturday was lesbian night. And I, I, um, I heard that men were not welcome there then. But really it was about, I, you know, I, just, I was photographing anybody that I thought was interesting. And typically they were people who scared me. Anybody that scared me had to be photographed. But I started getting annoyed over a little period of time. You know, because again, I was curious. You know, I immediately didn't care about the, these uh, drag queens or transsexuals dressed up in their outfits. I really wanted to know what was behind the facade. Oh, actually, before I went to their homes, then I started going into theater groups. I'd find, uh, you know, performance art that was going on. And again, it really wasn't about the, uh, it was never really about the stage performance, although sometimes I had to do that to make them happy. I wanted to be backstage. I wanted anything that was not seen by the general public. It was just a curiosity. But this is, as you can see, I'm starting to go behind the scenes now. I'm no longer in the front of, the, of any club. And this is when I decided that I was going to go into people's homes. Ruby was definitely one of them that would show up to the clubs. I was obsessed with Ruby. She was um, probably one of the most terrifying uh, people that I had met. I was obsessed with her so much, I actually repeatedly would go back to her house. Um, and she lived in some uh, bizarre part of San Francisco, very industrial That's his mother. They live in a 350-square-foot cockroach-infested apartment. (laughs) It does. So when I started this project, I love telling the story, not because um, I used to get Diane Arbus all the time, but it was because of this project. I was about one or two people in to going into these people's homes, and that's when my professor... I I did go to school, but I'm self-taught. So I went to school, I think, like five or six years, five years after... uh, 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 high school, or uh, after I started. I didn't want 35 millimeter. I wanted two and a quarter, and I wanted two and a quarter because I wanted clarity. And then I needed a flash. And the flash was actually because of Ouija. Had nothing to do with Dianarbus. I didn't know who Dianarbus was at the time. And then very quickly, my professor said, do you know who Dianarbus is? And I said, no. He says, you need to go up to the uh, library and, uh, and check this out. And, and I did, and, and literally, I'm obsessed with her. So a lot of these are um, transsexual prostitutes, people that would street walk. I would meet them on the street. I hung out on the street. I hung out in the bars. I did everything that I could to get to know them. Really, the way that it works is you find the ringleader, and that ringleader, as long as you can get good with them, they all kind of fall into place. And that's the ringleader. That's Lala. She held a lot of weight a lot of weight among the transsexual prostitutes. It took quite a while to get her to like me. And uh, when she did, it got to the point where I had prostitutes asking me to come over to their house. Um, Tammy Faye Baker, it was uh, current events at the time, I guess. (laughs) Bambi, very torch song. And sometimes it's after the shoot. I was walking out. He wanted to pose in that awful... I don't even know what they call that thing that he, that's strapped onto him. It's like some kind of lingerie or whatever. Um, and we did this whole shoot. He wanted to be naked. He wanted to have his penis erect. And, and I was annoyed. It felt so contrived to me. And then I'm on my way out, and I turn around, and he's, you know, put this little uh, um, robe on. And, um, you know, I had my twin lens. I, I was shoot with a Mamiya C330 Tri-X and then a uh, hammerhead flash. She I did not go home with, for, uh, and, and I'm still alive today, and I can actually tell you that. <laughs> uh, I think that she probably would have killed me because the agreement was that I park my car off the side of the highway on a certain exit, and she will come pick me up. And I drew the line. This is before cell phones. 89 to 91-ish, 92. And outside of a lot of these... Uh, transsexual uh, prostitutes' houses and, and theatrical performers um, are these street kids. 
And I was getting really tired of, the, of dealing with some of these people because, as you can imagine, the insanity level, the drugs, all that kind of stuff, it can you know, wear you down after a while. So I then switched over to these uh, street kids, and I photographed homeless uh, kids ranging from 10 to 18, 19, 20 years old, and then I spent another two years photographing them. And it really, at this point, I still have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. I'm just photographing my curiosity, and that's really where all this is coming from. It all comes kind of to a little screeching halt after, uh, after this project, and I'll uh, explain that in a, in a second. So while this is not traditional street photography, the work always involves the street. These people are coming off the street. I have to find them on the street. I just want to know more. That's, that's my th- Privacy is definitely uh, <laughs> an issue. This is a, a picture of uh, Byron uh, injecting heroin into his girlfriend, Carrie, the guy in the background has already shot his heroin. He, in the frame before, uh, maybe a frame or two before, was actually holding on to uh, that pole. I could tell something was terribly wrong. And then he collapsed and started convulsing. We're in an abandoned building. To get him out of there was a complete nightmare. Um, we had to, you know, it was like an army crawl through a, a bunch of crap. Again, privacy. The reason I love this photograph is not the oral sex, it's the privacy issue. When you're a street kid and you actually get into a squat and you get into a room, you sometimes have 15, 20 other kids around. And um, people just go on about their lives and you just kind of ignore it. So I think at this point I'm probably approaching like 23 years old, maybe. So what ended up happening is a friend of mine turned to me and said, you need to enter this street kid stuff into a contest. And I was never about contests. I really was just photographing for myself. I didn't care if anybody ever saw these pictures except my friends. They were for me to bring home and collect and for me to have these experiences. But I, the, the contest deadline was, I think, a day or two away. We sat up and did copy stand work all one night. If you ever did copy stand work back before uh, this wonderful world of digital, you then had to take the slide film. Remember the the silver masking tape and then the the gaffy or whatever those... uh, It was horrible. It was a long process. And I told her, I was like, I don't even have time for that. I just just want to keep shooting. And she was very, very persistent. And so we did. We did copy stand work one day, rushed the slide film the next day, stayed up all night masking Masking was basically to make sure that your image is nothing but black on the outside. You know, you don't see any of the, the white stuff. We submitted it into Pictures of the Year, which is like the Super Bowl of photography contests. And the next thing I knew, I got a call that I won first place. And it was definitely a life-changing moment for me, for professionals, yeah. Yeah. The next thing I know, I've got the University of Missouri School of Journalism knocking at my door. They want me to come. They want me to get my master's. They want me. They want me. They want me. And I said, why not? Um, I have nothing else going on. I'm not going to make any money running around photographing street kids. So how do you make money? You shoot for newspapers. You're not going to see any newspaper work. I promise you that. Maybe when I speak at the, uh, at the open house, maybe I'll show some. So I did. I went off and I got my master's. And the projects pretty much ceased. The reasoning for that was because my projects were daily. Daily and lasted years. The only way that I was able to get those pictures of the, the transsexuals, of the street kids, any of those people was repetition and being just as much a part of them, even though I would go home to my comfy little apartment. So I figured uh, if I can't do long-term photo essays, then I'm just not going to do it at all. And that's what happened. I spoke as well at the event. And here I share about my own experience of developing my own eye for not just my subject, but the entire scene, including the most mundane of elements. Anywhere that I am, I'm always looking, always observing the light. And if you do that, first and foremost, you'll find that your photography can and will change. Because there was, a, there was a time in my photographic journey that I was taking pictures, 
And I looked at them and I got really frustrated because I felt like I'm just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. I got into a point where I was really good at making a certain kind of photograph. But every time I would look at the slides or eventually when I started looking at the images on my computer screen, I would go, yeah, but I've shot this before. Why, why aren't my photographs as good as the people that I admired? And I would I collect a lot of monographs. And so I started looking through the books of Gordon Parks and Kadelka and Jay Maisel and Meyerwitz and Freelander. And all of a sudden it just clicked. It's light, stupid. You're not paying attention to the light. These guys are aware of the light. They're aware of shadow. And as soon as I started recognizing that, I went on a journey of trying to be able to discover what light looked like to me. I simply didn't want to just duplicate what they were doing. I wanted to see how I personally respond to light. Once I started doing that, it became an issue of, yeah, okay, I may have some really interesting light. I may have some interesting shadow. I may be able to make interesting photographs. But sometimes the shots still weren't there. But the, 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 the images still lack something. And then I began to think about, well, let me start thinking about the entire frame. Let me not think just about the subject. Let me think about what's behind the subject, what's in front of the subject, what's along the edges of the frame. And because you guys have all had this experience of making a photograph and you think it's absolutely amazing, you pull it up on your computer and you go, oh, I didn't see this crap over here, (laughs) right? That white truck or that person in the white T-shirt or that pole going out of that person's head. Because you get, I, got, I would get so focused on my subject, trying to get this thing, that I wasn't paying attention to anything else. And it was only when it was too late. Because I'm not someone who's going to go into Photoshop and clone stuff out. I really want to get it right in the camera. And so I started to pay attention to setting. To not just my subject, not just to the light, but everything else that's in the frame. And this is at the Grand Central Market. I was teaching a workshop, and I actually saw this guy walk by me but I was busy teaching, and I said, oh, he would have made an interesting shot. And then I let the students loose in the Central Market for about 15, 15 minutes, and I was walking towards the Broadway side, and I saw this guy seated at one of the uh, counters, and the light was coming from overhead, from one of the skylights, and just falling straight on him. And I was like, thank you. Right? But then it was like, I, I need to you know, work this the best that I can, and I started paying attention to what was happening behind the counter. And I saw that the, the warmth of the light was serving as a counterpoint to the light that was coming to the skylight. So I had this cool versus this warm. But I realized that I need for the guy behind the counter to do something interesting. And they were constantly moving. You know? But I kept making my shots. And like uh, was said previously, you don't just make one photograph. You make several photographs because the, that's one of the wonderful dynamics of the street is that it's constantly changing. It's always in flux. You know, you can't just raise the camera to your eye, make one photograph and walk away if you have any expectation of making a really wonderful photograph. You have to live in that moment for as long as you can. And I've been known to stand in the same place for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just working one particular place. Because sometimes I feel that the best shot is probably right here. It's not necessarily waiting for me around the corner. You know, I, I know initially when you do a lot of street photography, you just walk and walk and walk and walk and walk. I find my spots that I like to camp in there. If the light's good, if the setting's good, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick here. And, and trust that my gut is telling me that if you stick here, it will, it will pay off. So I waited until finally the guy was uh, using the ladle to bring out a, some soup. And I had, my, I had my shot. Photographs can happen anytime, including when you're on the road in the Dominican Republic and the tire get blows. And if, if you've ever been in the Dominican Republic, you'll know that people who are driving on the road do not stop as you are trying to change your tire. They're whizzing by really quickly. And it can be really, really dangerous. But I saw this as they were removing, trying to remove the spare from underneath the truck. And I always have my camera with me, and I looked on either side so I didn't get killed, and I made, made, that, made the frame. But I was not just aware of the tire, I was also aware of that line of the road and also the legs. And I made probably about three or four frames trying to f- refine the overall composition. But I was aware of every little element in that frame. 
And even though this is a relatively nothing moment, because I've been, I've been training myself to look all the time, not just when I have my camera, I looked at that and I recognized the potential of it for a photograph. And I think that's the greatest thing about street photography is that you, there's a moment where, you, where there's a switch that gets flipped in your brain and you realize that street photography is about potentiality. It's about potential. It's about being able to take moments that are completely ordinary and mundane and nothing to everyone else and within the context of that frame, you bring those elements together and something magical happens. You know, even in the scene that is as cluttered and as busy as this, I'm, I'm conscious not only about my subject, but how everything else within the frame sort of plays into it. The color, the lines, the shapes. And this is one of my favorite corners in downtown Los Angeles, and I have a lot of pictures that I've shot here because the light can be really interesting. And I find it a real challenge that with all this text and all this color, it can be really difficult to pull off a very interesting photograph. Because one of the things that you probably have heard is try to avoid having text in your images because that's the first place people go to. They want to read what those words are on, on, on the, you know, within the composition. So I try to sort of avoid it. But sometimes I feel like you know, that text is playing as much of a role as the color, as the light, as the shadow. But I oftentimes will return to those same scenes and try to pull off another shot. Because like I said, everything's always changing. So I could be at that spot for an hour and a myriad of different photographs could be presented to me in that period of time. And that's why I feel like just finding a spot and letting the world move around you and change is remarkable. And, and one of the secrets which I showed one of my students a couple of weeks ago, I did a one-on-one and uh, people talk about being invisible as a photographer and how they wish they could be invisible. And I showed her how I can just stand in a spot and how people are completely oblivious to me, even though I may be like three, four feet away from them and making a photograph. And what I told her, and I'll share it with you, is this idea is that you're not really invisible, but people just choose to ignore you, right? Because I'm there and I'm making photographs and they see me from 50 feet away or 75 feet away. They see me there with a camera making photographs. So when they come into my frame, they're not thinking I'm making a photograph of them. But I've already seen them coming, right? I've seen the light. I've seen my setting. And all I know is, like, I need something else to help complete the photo. It's going to be that person wearing the red hat or that woman with the yellow umbrella or whatever it is. I've always already seen them and already anticipated them. So when they come into my frame, I make my shot, but they think I was making a picture of something else. And that's, and that's the way I kind of sort of make myself invisible. And finally, we end with my friend Rinzi Ruiz, a photographer whose use of light and shadow have helped him to make unique and beautiful images of Los Angeles. In this final segment, he talks about how street photography helped him to develop a personal form of meditation on the street. So, like again, I was pretty stressed out at the time, really trying to find myself again and and what my purpose is and finding something to do that was both creative and didn't keep me on my computer all day and all night because that's what I did in graphic design. I would just sit on my computer. I wanted to be outdoors doing something else. So uh, I was happy when I found street photography because it reminded me of New York and just walking around or any vacation that I actually took, walking around, exploring, um, seeing new things and seeing things in new ways and taking pictures of them. And the more I did that, the more it started to relax me and it sort of calmed my brain down. I I, I was becoming more a happy person until I took street photography a little more seriously and started going out more because I got start like just like a lot of people, you get nervous, you get a little anxious, timid, whatever it is that you're feeling at the time because you're pointing a camera at somebody you don't know Um, and who knows what the heck, you know, how they're going to respond to you. 
And so that was a mental thing that I had to go through during the, maybe the first year or two of shooting was just walking out, trying to get more comfortable with being out there, doing that, and not getting so nervous that I'm not having a good time. And that's what kind of clicked in my mind. I said, I, I'm doing this to be relaxed, but I'm, then I'm not relaxed. So what do I got to do to calm myself down, to get to the point where I'm a little more comfortable around strangers and, and taking pictures of them? And, you know, I started sort of looking back at uh, meditation and how that affected me, right? And it, it really uh, put me in a, a peaceful mind. And so I started doing sort of a walking meditation as I was walking. I'd breathe in, breathe out, make sure that my thoughts were positive and that, that nothing, I wasn't thinking about, oh, this guy's going to punch me or oh, this lady's going to yell at me if I took their picture. It was replacing all of those thoughts with better thoughts or at least positive thoughts, right? Of, you know, I'm doing this to get better at what I'm doing. I'm doing this to relax. I'm doing this, you know, just focusing on the shot. Uh, there's a new manual setting that I want to check uh, or a new lens that I want to try out. And I'm just sort of focused on the learning aspect of photography. And that really blocked off a lot of the voices and the, and the, and the words that were coming to my head that was like, no, you're not, you know, you suck or that person's going to, you know, punch you or they're going to, you know, they're going to think you're a creep or whatever it is. So I'm, I'm, I try to get as much of those thoughts out of my mind uh, during this time and it helped, you know, the breathing aspect of it. And this is sort of what I teach a lot in my one-on-one workshops because uh, a lot of people come, you know, into street photography and that's sort of the first thing is that initial, uh, if you call it fear or just nervousness of, of um, being in public and, and taking pictures of it. And it really is just a switch of the mind and thoughts and relaxing yourself because, like, when you're nervous and you're timid and you're, and you're scared, you're putting off that energy and so people look at you in that way and and that's what brings the attention to you it's not really a lot of times it's not even the camera being put to your eye it's it's the energy that you're putting out like you know I've been in certain sitting in certain rooms and somebody walks in with just like a weird vibe and energy and you can everybody looks kind of can tell when that person comes that's that's sort of how I feel I don't know if everybody anybody else feels that way but uh I I can certainly feel that sort of energy when when somebody walks in the room like that you know, street photography for me was a good way to learn how to shoot better, how to take better pictures, how to learn my cameras. And so there's lessons that I uh, learn from, and I really take certain photographs and keep those photographs around so as a reminder of the lessons that I've learned by taking those photographs. One of the first ones is patience. I mean, it's huge to be... To, to learn patience because um, some people, you know, everybody has a different way of going about things. And I know some people just, they, they can just walk and walk and walk and walk and take pictures and they're just like sort of on a hunt uh, versus sort of being a little more patient and just waiting around for a scene to sort of come together, right? For certain people and certain, uh, the, you know, light ra- uh, the light, the background, the, the subject matter to all sort of come together. And, and it takes standing around in a, in a place for a little bit to kind of wait for that, that thing to happen. Uh, and I know other people where they, they're just going around and, you know, it's just a quick thing. And, and, I, and I've done both, and, and I've gotten pictures doing both. Uh, but, you know, this is the photo that really taught me. And, I, and this one, I waited f- about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, this is in L.A. I can't remember what the name of that bank is, but it's right, right next to the uh, First National Bank. And uh, on top of a balcony, and this was with the original X100. I just sat there. Uh, nowadays, the security guards tell me to to shove off, but uh, at that point, um, I waited. And I took about I would say like fifteen to twenty photos of people walking, and they all looked okay. They looked decent. Uh, you know, different sort of angles that I, that I would take depending on where the person was walking. And, and none of them really did it for me. And it wasn't until this guy with a white hat came out and gave sort of a, a, a place for the eye to go first that did it for me. So this one really taught me to just be, really be patient and to um, 
sometimes just wait around a little bit and, and observe and let things come together, right? And, and the thing about that is people come to you. You don't have to walk around so much. And, and after that, I was like, man, my feet are so much happier for that. Uh, it's just my body, you know. And, and at the time, well, luckily, I was shooting with the X100 because it's super light. Uh, compared to like when I was walking around with the D90 or the D700 with like whatever lenses that are on that were on it, so the second lesson that I learned was light. You know, I, I Barnex talked a lot about that last uh, yesterday, um, and he was one of the inspirations for that as well. My my friend Frank Jackson as well um, inspired me to focus on the light. Uh, I asked Frank, I was like, "How do I see in black and white?" And he was like, "Just focus on the light." and Something in my head was like, no, no kidding, that exactly. Like, it may, it, it really simplified it for me because um, I thought, like, is, are there special glasses that you can wear that you can see in black and white? He's like, no, just focus on the light. And so everything for like the la- the next year or two until up until now is basically uh, focusing on how light. And this one, this is one of the pictures that really like punched it into my face. Like, light is so important and how it can shape and how uh, you can express emotions and how it produces depth and, and a lot of like the, the things that light does to um, to photograph. So that was a huge lesson and it really, really improved my photography and it sort of honed what I look at when I'm walking around, almost like a, f- a moth to uh, to a flame almost, like that's kind of how I am. I almost don't look at anything if it's in the shade. I'll walk on the sunny side of the street and sweat my, you know, sweat myself cuz I just know I'm going to get uh, you know, better photos and then moments and and that's when sort of I took the the patience thing and the light and sort of started combining all the different things that I learned during that time I was practicing and practicing and you know, certain things just uh, started to click. So this one I waited a while and I focused on the light and I waited for a moment because he was at this is in um, Olvera Street uh, just down down there and you know he was walking around talking to the customers and he's uh, talking to his employee and and he just didn't feel that in my frame didn't feel right it never was like uh, in the right place and then suddenly he just did did that and I was like no freaking way that's awesome and I went home and, and uh, processed it, and I was, I was super happy with the result. And it was because I started putting uh, things together. We, I think we know what that is. I, I think I forgot to take that up. But basically, that's street photography. So I kept practicing and, and practicing. And then in 2011, this was right after I got laid off, Eric uh, Kim, I'm sure some of you are familiar with him, uh, invited me to go with him to Tokyo. And I had a good time there, and I was still learning a lot about photography, and and I met a lot of cool people out there, Charlie Kirk and um, uh, Alfie Goodrich and uh, Bellamy Hunt, the uh, cam- Japan ha- uh, camera hunter guy. Uh, you know, I decided to leave these ones in color because it just really, for me, that, that it works and it just worked for me in color a lot better. Also do some street portraits. Now, that how, the, how my street portraits come about, I don't necessarily go out and mean to take like or, or go out to take street portraits it's sort of just um I, I like them to happen organically um with just specific people and some of them they come to me and some of them i come to them i'm not walking around going hey can i you know i, I still enjoy taking things candidly uh to get the genuineness of of whatever the moment is or the light or, or things like that but I think the street portrait is definitely a, a part of like the overall street photography uh, genre. A lot of people take street portraits, and and you know it's just how it's done. Practice. I mean, that's basically every day for me. Everything that I do is is practice. Even though, even if I end up liking a photo, I feel like okay, well, that was practice for you know whatever uh, comes next, um, and. You know, the street photography helped me with trying to learn things for, for like, wedding photography, portrait photography, events, stuff like that. Um, You know, with with being, knowing my camera well enough to change settings for different lighting situations and and just being 
conscious and and your eyes are focused on seeing certain things and it takes that kind of practice of doing trying to do it every day and going out and kind of seeing in your own specific way right and seeing the the little moments and there's certain things I'll, I'll just watch it happen I go oh damn that was the picture right like that's every day I'm, I'm always seeing things where I'll just kind of watch things and, 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 and observe and see the moments. And then later on, I can go, okay, those are the moments I need to watch out for when I'm taking photos. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the show. We will be back next week with our normal format. Thank you for your continued support of The Candid Frame. If you haven't already, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. Your ratings and comments help people to discover the great conversations like the ones you heard today. Thanks to Sleeves from Brazil for his five-star review. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. Visit patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame, or you'll find a link in the show notes and The Candid Frame website. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution to the show, you can do so via PayPal by clicking on the donate button on the Candid Frame website or the show notes. Thanks to John Andrade and Dean Tate for their recent contributions. It means a lot. Thank you so much. To access our complete archive of interviews, download the free Candid Frame app available for Apple iOS, Android, and Windows. It's the fastest and most convenient way to hear and save any of the great interviews we present here at TCF. Links for each can be found in the show notes and the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbarianX. And this is IbarianX, and this is The Candid Frame.